thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate it. And most of all, appreciate uh, Tony and Jeremy's time here. We were expecting um, Alex to join us as well, but he's got called away to do an assessment, a lean assessment at one of Church and Dwight's factories uh, in the country. So he won't be joining us and sends his apologies. So, uh, Tony, if you will open up with you, if that's all right. Um, sure. Last time we had a session, you spoke of your accidental carter. Uh, and we also discussed um, an obstacle list that we'll talk a second. But if you can, would you mind just take us taking us over what you meant by your accidental carter and what happened there? Yeah, let me uh, share my screen really quick, Oscar. Thank you. So you should be able to see my screen now. Yep. Okay, so back in uh, uh, April, coming out of the uh, Kata and the TWI summit, um, we had a Kaizen scheduled, and uh, we purposely engineered this Kaizen to lean heavily on TWI job instructions. And what we were trying to do was to standardize the way we take care of one of our uh, capital pieces of machine. And you can see this is a, a typical church and white Kaizen charter. Um, although you, after our Kata training, you can see it does have a challenge statement embedded in it. But going into this, nobody was even remotely thinking Kata. This was, we've got a, a abnormal situation with lots of variation. And we're going to use job instruction breakdowns to standardize the way we care for this uh, asset. So let me show you kind of the schedule, and you're going to start seeing why I call it an accidental kata. So the team and I, we went out onto the floor and we watched how the machine operators care for this asset with no coaching, no instructions, just how they just normally do it, um, you know, kind of a as is. And from there, we came back uh to our training room and we compared notes on what we saw, what we liked, what we didn't like. We looked at the charter and the challenge statement again and wanted to take the routine from where it was to where it needed to be at the end of this week long event. And uh, so we started jotting some stuff on the board and really Oscar, I wasn't getting kind of a, uh, the response out of the engineers and the maintenance techs and everybody that was part of this event. And I was getting frustrated to trying to extract information out of them. And granted, it was Monday. And uh, so we went to break. And when I came back from break, I realized that everything that I needed, I already knew. And even better yet, I had on this Kata card. So they came back, they sat down, settled down. And I started going through the coaching kata questions, even though this was in no one's idea uh, a, a kata project. And, mm -hmm. You know, and I said, so you know, I started asking the questions, and it was just remarkable how quick the group started participating. And so you speak of this board, and so we just started writing things down. Uh, it started off with the challenge, right? We knew we wanted this essential care routine to be less than 30 minutes. And of course, we knew we didn't want to compromise safety effectiveness and ask anybody to work faster. And then you can see on the bottom left, that was our current situation. And uh, Which you just observed when you'd been out that Monday morning. That was something that many of the things, you know, that was built on what you observed, was it? That's exactly it. I mean, we had stopwatches <laughs> and video cameras rolling. And this is just, other than us being out there, we had no effect on the, the routine at this point. Sure. So, um, yeah, we knew where we were. We knew where we wanted to be. And then I started having even more kata aha moments. And so, you know, still, I, I'm by no means any kind of, uh, expert on this. I'm still very novice at it, but I started asking the group, all right, what are our obstacles of getting there? 
And I told them, you know, the team, I said, it's natural for us not to know how we're going to go from current to the challenge, but I started identifying obstacles. And so that's when we came up with this obstacle list that you see up here. Cool. Cool. So just to be clear, that challenge statement that's on the right was the challenge statement that was came from that Kaizen document you had there before, wasn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, spot on. So <clears throat> um, just one thing I didn't say at the start, if anyone has any, if any, anyone has any questions for um, Tony or Jeremy as we go, please post them. I've got a couple of questions that I've got for them, but if you anyone else has got any questions for them, please post them as we go, and I'm, I'm uh, happy to you know, ask them as we go through this. But one thing did came up, did come up. I know when we discussed this, Tony, regarding what's been listed as obstacles. Do you just want to explain that learning we had there when we were when we had our mentoring about a month or so ago? When we went through this. There was a, you know, there was a comment I made on that obstacle list. Can you just um, explain that, please? Yeah. So yeah, when you and I were having our coaching session, you know, I was excited to point out. Look here, here's eight obstacles that get from current to challenge. And what was even more exciting for me at the time was, you know, these were coming from the participants. And you pointed out, and now that you've pointed out, it makes absolute sense to me. These are not the obstacles. These were the solutions to people's perceptions of the obstacles. Yes. Yeah, correct. So, and the point I made there was it's a common, um, it's a common mistake or not a common learning point <clears throat> is that when you, pe when you ask people to present obstacles or well, what are the obstacles to, to where we're headed, and, you know, our target condition, our challenge, what are our obstacles, is that they will present the obstacles in the form of solutions, which is essentially yeah. what's happened there. If you read those seven, we need unit harmonisation. We need tools at point of use. We need coordination between units. They're not obstacles. They're perception. They're people's perceived answer to obstacles. And it's a very, very common thing when people are learning to, to practise scientific thinking through the Carter. That, that, that that's what will happen because our, our mind jumps to solutions. Our mind will jump straight away to solutions. So the, as an example, um, the obstacle of that was presented as tools point of use, what was the actual obstacle there, Tony? The machine operator did not have the tools available to do the job when the job needed to be done. Yeah, and so therefore there was a delay. There was delays looking for tools. They were walking for tools. They were hunting for tools, for example. There, there was the actual obstacle. Was that a fair comment? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and what about that one of prep communication? That's uh, I found that an interesting one. What was That was the solution. What was the actual obstacle? What was the problem? Do you remember? When it was, yeah, the, the, the obstacle was... Uh... We call them a, a, a shift lead or a factory lead. You know, they need to give uh, kind of direction to the team. You know, this is when we're going to start, and these are the expectations. Um, and at that point, when that lead is supposed to be given this presentation, there was no harmonization to it. Every time he had something different to say, and it really became hard for the machine operators to digest because there was just no standardization to the way the communication was happening. Yeah, so the obstacle was that the that the communication was 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 varied in its delivery, it was missing stuff or maybe it didn't happen. That was the for example, that was the actual obstacle. Well, am I right yeah. in that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay, spot on. So we do have a question here from uh whoops where is it? How do I bring up this question? I saw it before. Question from Tony, I think, uh, from James Clark. And he says, Tony, was this before you had any formal training in Carter? So maybe just give a minute or two to, to those um, uh, just to those who haven't um, joined us in other webinars and just to help them understand the journey. So how did this fit in with the formal training of Cardi you had in terms of timing? Yeah, so we had formal training with Oscar um, September of 2022. 
um, using the TWI five day, two hour day uh, course. So yeah, I did have some formal training, but I was the only one in the room that had any formal training. When you did this exercise in front of us. I did it, correct. Yes, sure. And James has asked another question. Uh, is it better to have participants rephrase the solutions than as current state? Um, yeah, so yes. Essentially, the short answer to that question is yes. Uh, quite often in current state, you will find the obstacles are either implicit in there or explicit. But yes, it's better to go back to what's happening now. If they're presenting the solutions, well, hang on, before you we go to those, just tell me what's happening now, um, James. So, And that is current state. So yes, well done. Good answer. Yeah, uh, good I question. Do want to, I do want to say, uh, Oscar, um, I think what we see evidence of is the formal training uh, permeating into the way I conduct business. Like I said, I didn't even set this up as a formal cotta project, but when you go back and look at it, um, you know, once we got the current state, we had an opportunity to go out and experiment and keep updating that experiment with uh, removing those obstacles. So yeah. uh, the, the training, and I think Jeremy will probably uh, say something very similar, it becomes the way you do business, even if it's not the formal way you're doing business. And yeah, even if it's not explicit, even if it's not obviously there. And that's good. From my perspective, um, that's where we want it. That's, those of you who practice sufficiently, will have it, that sort of realisation will occur as it did with you, which is exactly where we want you to be as such. You know, I think it's not about bringing that card out every time and it's not about it being explicit necessarily um, and the, on the whiteboard, you know, one, two, three, four, once it starts to sink in, then for it to be, um, to be sort of almost hidden away is what I would expect. So that's good. That's a good example. I think that's, this accidental Carter is a good um, example of how you've, Tony, how you've transitioned to that. So much appreciated. Um, Jeremy, if we can go over to you, when we last had our mentoring, you spoke of two team members that were now pushing you along. Can you yeah. can you elaborate on that, please? Sure. Now it's up to three. Uh, three. That's good yeah. news. That is good news, not for me, but for them. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so I think I've we just kind of, kind of touched on it. We've talked about it. Uh, Kata is a doing thing, right? You've always said that Kata is a doing thing. And that's yes. kind of how I practice this. So like Anthony said, yeah, you go to the training and you try to understand the pattern thinking so you can bring it back and use that as your coaching experience. But what I've experienced is I kind of let people do their natural scientific method and I just use the Kata um, framework so that I can keep everything kind of moving in a certain direction, right? I kind of guide them is really what I do with it. So what I found at first is, just to recap is people were just kind of all over the place. So when you try to break it down a little bit and focus on one of the obstacles and work on that, what I found then is they tend to be a little more narrow focused and they tend to understand the process naturally. So they quickly jump from one thing to the next. So the first thing they push me on is data, right? You're always trying to get quick data so you can make quick decisions and see how this thing's going. And they're always asking me for more data. So one of the examples I had was a wheel that we were measuring for where, and they were asking me, hey, did you take the data yet? Did you get the data? Where are we at? What's it looking like, right? I want to switch to a different wheel, you know, this type of thing. So I have to keep up with them. So I have to find ways to keep up with them. Uh, but also they're pushing me for new obstacles. So that's an interesting uh, item. Sometimes they're already pushing to test new obstacles before you even complete the first. So that's where you, as a coach, can have to come in and ask your questions, right? Like, what is our, have we reached our target condition yet? Things like that. Um, sure. The words are, I won't say not important, but they are important so that they understand what you're trying to explain, but it's important just to be on the same page so that when you use the same words over and over again, they know what you're speaking about, uh, current condition, target condition, things like that. But 
all in all, it ends up being the same thing over and over again. The people, the more people I expose it to, the more they start doing and the more they start asking more questions. And the other thing they do is they take ownership. It starts to become something that they have pride in and they want other people to know about it and they want other people to respect that process so they're not making their life more difficult by introducing variables, things like that. Just a question there. With the getting of the data, I'm interested that they're asking you for data. Is that, you know, is the next, is one of the steps you can foresee is where they start to get the data themselves? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I think that's a natural evolution for myself. But uh, yeah, I think at this point, I was just trying to encourage the behavior and see where I could help out rather than, yes. I didn't want to create obstacles to the process. So they got um, maybe annoyed with it, I guess is the word, you know, so I tried to find ways to facilitate it, but I agree with you hundred percent. Yeah. I see. Using so a what, I, yeah. what I understand you're doing there is doing some stuff for them to show them the benefit. Is that Correct. right? And then if you can show them the benefit, then they at some point, you'll you'll have it'll be easier for you to move it on to them well hey how about you gather the data now you can is Correct. that where you have it exactly and the sort of same applies for the um obstacles it interested me there that you said that you were can you just explain that you were needing to um ad help them identify the obstacles rather than them coming up with them themselves no actually what i said was they were coming up with obstacles but they were starting to test other wanted to test other obstacles, experiment on other oh, obstacles sorry. before they reach the target condition. So you have to kind of once again use that to control experiments so you know exactly what's happening when you've reached your goal and then move on to the next one. But what uh -huh. happens is through the data they learn things. So then their mind starts, so they start doing it themselves. They start seeing learnings and it generates new questions and they get excited, want to go in different directions. Okay. Where I'm doing as a coach is just trying to not stymie that, but keep it in a linear direction towards the uh, ultimate objective. Sure. And Jeremy, the other thing, thank you for that. The other thing that um, I was going to ask you to talk about was you had a introduction to your team leaders and, and um, you had an interesting experience out of that, from what I recall. Pardon me. And you also explained it really simply. And I know you and I now wish we'd recorded that coaching session that we had as a group because we were not 100% clear what you said. But have you been able to go reflect back and, and, and remember how that went? Yeah, I think I can get the, uh, the general sense of it. But so we have leadership meetings, which contains all of our management and supervisor staff, anybody that leads people. I introduced the concept of Kata, kind of explained what we went out to uh, be trained on last September. Um, but really what I wanted to do for them was not get bogged down with what we learned in the training with all the different elements and uh, how everything fits together. What I wanted them to understand is that scientific thinking is natural behavior amongst their people. And we're using this, uh, this pattern of thinking to facilitate that and encourage it. So that's really what I want them to get from Kata was, I'm just presenting some tools that they can use to provide some framework to encourage this type of behavior and do it in a way that benefits uh, everybody in a controlled way, really. Yeah, good. I love the way you put that then. And that might have been what you said, that it was a way of um, introducing or, or, or establishing a behavior. So I think we get stuck on the, the, I think one of the reasons that Carter has sometimes got a bit off track is we talk, it's viewed as a method. Whereas what you've done and what I really love, Jeremy, is you've taken that structure that we studied and practiced last September and used that in, to develop behaviours in your people. And that is exactly what it's intended to do. That's not supposed to be a method. It's supposed to be something you can use to help develop behaviours. Um, so I love, I think that's probably what you said. I love the way you put that. Thank you for that. And you, you, had, you said that after the meeting, someone did pop their ears up or so, someone did follow up with you. Can you just elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, so actually I've had a couple people follow up with me, so I might remember that detail. But uh, um, really where people are at is they see these things going on in their area already, right? But they don't know how to facilitate them or 
don't want to say control them, but give them some structure, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, really, the person I remember coming up to me after the meeting says, I want a kata. I think that's what they said, like, teach me to kata or something like that. Uh, uh -huh. So it's, it's interesting when you present to them kind of what you're doing and how it works for you. You know, people can see some connections to their current situation, their current uh, job structure, which, you know, makes them excited about it. So hopefully so we'll get more you, people involved. I find that interesting. When you, you obviously know that person reasonably well, you work with them. What was it about that individual that do you think attracted them as such? Well, one, they're in quality. They're a quality person. So I already know that they have that mindset that kind of parallels with the kata. Right? right. So they what they know is problem solving. Right. But what quality has to deal with are a large uh, subset of people with different motivations, different backgrounds, uh, things like that. So where they're coming from is if I can find a tool that helps me, if I can find a way to a uh, tool structure like that helps me do this on a quick basis and gives me the ability to, I guess, better do my job and achieve my outcomes that I need. Uh, by helping people focus their behavior in a certain way, I'd yes. be very interested in learning that. Okay, so it was the QA's perspective was how do we channel, it's a behavior thing, how do we channel the energy so we're all Correct. working on this thing together, not heading in multiple directions? Correct. Yeah, that's good. That makes sense. Uh, one a question for either of you. One of the participants, I don't know if they're present now, but when they registered, uh, Ashok Motwani, said is improve is carter deployment possible if there is an external coach and a desiring learner who is not able to get support from within i'll take that one first uh right. i think that's a yes and a no question for me i think yes. the no part of it is the relationships you have with people and the trust you have with people sometimes when you have a foreign concept that you introduce um, you have to be careful with how that is so you don't start off on the wrong foot, so to speak, right? So you have to do this, and that's what I found. I do it in a more natural way where I kind of let them do what they were going to do without me. I just yes. try to provide some framework to it. I think yes. an external person would have more technical ability to it, but they may not have that relationship to build the trust. So there may be a little bit of a – may take longer to get there, but I definitely think either way would get to the same end point. Cool. So um, I think what I hear, you, what I'm hearing you saying there is, you are able to take the technical view that I sort of I I illustrated, and um, because you knew the people, you were able to turn it into a language or a style, whatever you want to call it, that was going to be uh, digestible for them. That was my goal. Yes. Yeah. Whereas if they'd taken just my technical view, as such, they, it may not have been so digestible. And I understand, and I truly respect that. I think that's great that you've been able to do that, that transition as good as, as well. Tony, what are your thoughts on that question? I believe uh, the same thing. Um, there, there's something about, especially in uh, our environment, you know, the level of trust needs to be established before you really start getting into uh, problem solving with this methodology. Um, so it would, it would be a tough sell here in Washington to have an external coach come in and just go straight to the floor where our problems are solved. I think you touched on a, on a key thing and it's, um, and, and it is, yeah, then I've certainly experienced that is that there needs to be some a certain amount of trust pleasant present uh, before you can start working with this stuff. I think if this it, it, and sometimes I've, I've sometimes thought it is a way of building trust. But what I have seen is where there's trust already present, it accelerates quicker. I think it's probably yep. a reasonable way of putting it. So for both of you, uh, this is our last webinar we'll have, by the way, for those of you who've joined the others, the other ones we've done, this is our last in the series. If you were to, if you were to um, switch the clocks back to October or whatever, yeah, October last year, uh, I was just looking at a comment from Scott Co Coppel, yeah, a trust where I've heard that before. 
many times in our discussions, Scott, thank you for observing that. Um, if you were to turn the clock back, what would you do? Would you do anything differently? And if so, what would you do different? For me, um, you know, this, the Kata training was a corporate exercise. Um, and I have the benefit that we had like three managers in the rotation. Um, I would have liked to have a couple of people that were closer to the floor, uh, especially I, I like to call, you know, machine operators who have influence. Yes. Just so they could have got some of the technical training too. Fortunately, we had limited headspace. Um, yeah, so that's, right. that's the only thing I would have done different is get a couple of those lower level influencers to participate in the formal training. Sure. Uh, Jeremy? I would agree with Anthony. I think that uh, I just spoke about the technical part of it versus the what, my application part of it. But I do think if there were some key personnel at the uh, floor level that would have some of that technical experience, it would definitely help just overall Thanks. building the culture, right? It would be, they would be talking about it more and they could help guide it instead of me, who's maybe got less less uh, touch points. I have fewer touch yeah, points sure. than somebody who's day-to-day, -day, shoulder to shoulder. Sure, thank you. And have you had any surprises along the way? Uh, yeah. Who asked that? Uh, Tim, McC uh, Keith Jones, I think it is. Keith Jones had asked, what surprises did you encounter along the way? I think the surprise for me was how quickly people actually latched onto it. <laughs> I was expecting a different uh, situation. I think the first time we tried it, it was a little more formalized with more of your teachings and things like that. And that one did not seem to catch on. But when I kind of changed my approach to just kind of let them do what they're going to do, it took off quicker than I was expecting and maybe quicker than I was able to keep up. So I had yeah. to navigate that. That was probably my biggest surprise, how quickly they kind of adapted the behavior. Yeah, one, I think that, that once you Jeremyized it, for want of a better <laughs> word. No, I'm serious. And so yeah. I think, and I know from our discussions, you've, you have Jeremyized it, but I think that was very valuable because, you know, they, they I would suspect, given your, the, um, what I know of you, they trust you. So once it was Jeremyized, your chances of success went up considerably. I would say that worked for me, and I would find encourage others to do something similar to work for them. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's really about like you said the behavior. So however you get to that behavior, that that's the key. Sure. Well done. Well said, Tony. Any surprises? Um, just how it accidentally or. Uh, very subtly just creeps into the way that I've done business for the last uh, almost year now. Now I approach, you know, situations where things have fallen off the rail. Um, and just to jump back to last, last question, uh, I think there's a lot of value in the technical training, especially at the floor level. And I know uh, Washington at some point is going to, invite you or someone from the institute back oscar we're gonna we're gonna host this at the floor level it's good for the management to see but we need uh the floor level to really start buying into the methodology i think there's a lot of fruit there to be gained just like with the ji program and stuff mm. not good um all right i bet we're at the bottom of our hour um bottom of the hour so Tony and Jeremy, thank you very much. And as I said, it is the last, and I know this has been a, a bit of an imposition for you to do these, and I appreciate you putting the time aside. I really do. And thanks very much for the way you've taken what we did in September, October last year and and um, adapted it. And that's, I think there's a phrase in, I don't remember the exact words, in maybe the original Toyota Carter book by Mike Rother, um, where he talks about that, if it stays, if it stays exactly as you learnt it for you know, much more than three months, then it's it's not happening. It's not happening the mm -hmm. way it was intended to happen. It needs to be translated into something that more uh, the principles need to need to be sustained and translated into something that works at the local level. So appreciate that. Good and a number of people have put the thank yous up: Franz, Scott, Shannon, McGoran, uh, James Clark. Has also uh, a number of commented, so it's not just 
Uh, there's a whole heap coming up. Rick Perry. Um, yeah. And so a couple of others. I have a quick question. Um, we have asked if contact information can be shared. Do you mind if I share your email addresses with the webinar recording that I send out? I do not. I don't have, I don't have a problem with that either. I'm okay. okay. No, and I don't mind either. Scott. Okay. So for those of you in the chat, you probably just heard that. So I will send the email addresses out with the webinar recording. And just a quick reminder, you will get that link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours with their email addresses. Good on you. And Skylar, as I as always, thanks. I know you do a lot of work in the background and thanks very much for organizing and hosting this. Everyone, wherever you are in the world, have a good afternoon, morning, wherever it may be. And thanks again, guys. Much appreciated. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank you. We'll see you Bye. later. Bye-bye.